Welcome to the webinar series 3.0 organized by JIS Institute of Advanced Studies and Research. I'm Devovani Ganguly, today's host. Before I introduce our speaker, please allow me briefly introduce our newborn institute. This is our postgraduate research institute under the leadership of Padma Shri Professor Ajay Kumar Ray. We aim to contribute interdisciplinary translational research, creativity, and entrepreneurship towards the transformation and welfare of our society. We have three centers, data science, health science, and technology, and interdisciplinary sciences. I'm representing Center for Health Science and Technology, or CHEST in short. We have very well-equipped experimental lab with fully functional Illumina MySec next generation sequencer. This is actually rare in any academics in Eastern zone. The sequencer, not only an important instrument in our research being, but also will help our student to be trained and use this experience in job market. We also have good HPC facilities for computational research being. Our research interest comprises of bacterial virulence and antibiotic resistance, big data pathogen evolution in nature, image processing and computer vision, host pathogen interactions, human microbiome and metagenomics, medical microbiology, medical imaging and machine learning, molecular modeling and drug designing. There are several ongoing research projects that we have funded by DBT, ICMR, DBT Welcome Trust, Ramling Oshime Fellowship, etc. This is our faculty profiles, which are available in our website. We offer two years MSc in medical biotechnology and bioinformatics and two years MTech in bioinformatics. We are looking for PhD scholars. Both integrated and regular options are available. These are the fields that we are interested. Admission is going on. Interested candidate can apply online. For any admission related update, contact us via these numbers or drop us email at biosim at the red gisis.org or visit our website www.jisiasr.org for online applications or you can ask any questions and we are also available in our website and Facebook page. Let's start the talk. I'm privileged to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Omrita Bhattacharya, one of the promising young science scientists in India. He is assistant professor of Department of Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science, IIT Bombay. Dr. Bhattacharya has done her PhD in Computational Material Science from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, in 2013. She has carried out her postdoctoral research as a Max, Max Planck scientist in Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society, Berlin, Germany, for a period of about four years, following which she was worked as a DST inspired faculty in CSI National Physical Laboratory, India. She has joined MEMS Department of IIT Bombay as assistant professor in late 2017. The main research thrust of her group is to analyze the charge and heat transport phenomena in solid using different ab initio techniques and experiments. She also uses different statistical machine learning model to predict properties of materials for their quintessential applications. She has been elected a member of National Academy of Science India in 2020. Let's introduce Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, now please start the talk. And uh, for the participant, if you have any questions, please write it down on QA section or chat section. After the talk, Dr. Bhattacharya will address all the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, uh, please, I'm, stop, uh, I'm stopping my screen here. So now you can start.
so should i start now so am i audible yes please yeah yeah you are audible and you can start now okay. yeah. yeah i'll just please. try to minimize this panel which is over here yeah mm -hmm. so i think i am visible as well so yes, uh, today yeah yeah so today's topic so uh, when uh, professor ganguly approached me to give this talk she said like you have to give it for you know chemist and biologist so i am not a chemist i am physicist working in a mems department which is material science department and i was told to deliver a talk for chemist so chemist or biologist so what i found was the connection was this density functional theory which is celebrated in is celebrated from it can be used for diverse you know interdisciplinary field as like you see like i'm physicist using practicing density functional theory but you know the connection is this theory itself which was developed by chemists and is now you know in is current from used celebrated by everyone so therefore the title of this talk today is density functional theory for localized as well as extended systems so uh, okay so let's go forward so uh, then we are talking about materials in this length and time scale so materials phenomena of the order uh, of time scale in the femtosecond and length of the order of nanoscale we are talking about materials in this range and for you know understanding the phenomena in this range so the theme of the comp so computational material science goes very broad so it's in diverse length and time time scale you can study the phenomena but today in this talk specially i am going to talk about this particular length and time scale and here you see like we are going to use the density functional theory so which is the also the title of the talk so let's go ahead so let's look at the other part of the talk that i told so is the localized as well as the extended system so what are localized systems localized systems if i i tell about localized system what comes to my mind first is like should be confined to a you know special special uh, coordinate so for example this molecules that you see are confined so these are my localized systems whereas if i see a system which is like this so which is a small you know uh, uh, lattice which is shown in here so if you extend it over the space it gets extended and you can apply the periodic boundary condition by selecting any one of the unit cell so then it becomes your uh, a confined system or extended system so this is my localized system whereas this is my extended system so then uh, you can ask me what is the difference the difference is not much difference is the solution so if you see a localized system which is confined like this the solution is something like if you uh, to tell me to pick a solution the solution which will be also localized it should die down at the you know diverse ends but how should be uh, however you know localized to every atoms that you see in here fine so therefore you will pick up a solution which should be a gaussian type solution which is e to the power uh, alpha x square which has been shown in this however if you are looking at a extended system which is a periodic solid and if you are picking a unit cell of this which is this small one a bravais lattice then you are going to apply a periodic boundary condition because it should be extended all over the space and should you know give you the entire uh, entire phenomena and therefore you are going to use a block type solution which is a plane wave solution which has been shown like this and therefore you are going to use the solution which is like this e to the power plus minus i k x some you know modulating function towards it so this is uh, basically a block solution and uh, this is what uh, you know the extended system is all about so this is the two dis uh, difference between the localized system and extended system and then we are going to study how to you know look towards and you know uh, like computationally solve this problem like uh, in a in a in a computer how do i solve a problem before you know knowing so much about the system in a ab initio way so we are going to look into that so let us see how we can proceed so the if i simplify this problem further no matter it, it's the molecule or it's the you know periodic solid what it will come down to is a many body problem and this is the many body simplest many body problem that i can think of so i have just drawn it very you know fast so you can see there are two atoms which are shown in this labels a and b and therefore uh, and there are electrons two electrons that i have shown you one electron here ei and another electron here ej so this is a many body system for me the simplest many body system and uh, you can now think of how to write the hamiltonian 
So whenever a physicist or a chemist look at a problem, they will have to construct a Hamiltonian. So how to construct this Hamiltonian for the simplest problem? So let us see. So if I am told to write a Hamiltonian for this system, what I will do is I will try to write the Hamiltonian for this atom over here and this atom over here. And in order to do that, you will see that this whole entire system will uh, drop down to some you know, Hamiltonian of electron, some Hamiltonian for ion, and some Hamiltonian for electron ion. We'll just look into it in a little bit details, but here what I want to say is like, this is only for two atoms and two electrons. However, if you have more than two atoms, more than two electrons, what you are going to do is you are just going to do a summation over this, summation over this, as well as the summation over the entire uh, this thing. So where it, this will be the, uh, so this will be the ionic coordinates for you. So this will be the electronic coordinates and this will be again the ionic coordinate for us, electron or ionic coordinate that I will show you in details, you know, in the next slide. So this simplest many body, so simplest two body problem that I have shown you in here can be generalized to a many body problem. So by many body problem, I mean like I have electrons of the order of 10 to the power 23. You can also have, you know, atoms of the order of that. Then how are you going to solve your Schrodinger equation? So Schrodinger equation is that, uh, that you see in here, in its celebrated from H psi equals to E psi. And then this H here depends on what? This H here depends upon the nucleus, the number of nucleus and the number of electrons which are surrounding the, you know, nucleus. So the electrons are not shown here. You can just think like they are just, you know, swarming around like this around each of the nucleus. So now let us see what is this Hamiltonian consisting of. The Hamiltonian basically consists of the kinetic energy of the electrons. So kinetic energy of the nucleus first. So e, all these nucleus are also revolving or, you know, uh, you know, they are not stationary. So there should be some kinetic energy of this nucleus then some kinetic energy of the electrons because the electrons, the electronic cloud around the you know, nucleus are also not stationary. So you will have to add the kinetic energy of the electron. So these are these two terms over here. Then you have the potential energy, which is the Coulombic repulsion between the nucleus because nucleus are positively charged nucleus. So therefore, this is the potential energy of the nucleus that you see in here. And then you also have the you know, potential energy that an electron in this cloud feels from the other electrons. So this is basically this term, the electron electron, which is the electron electron Coulombic repulsion. This is the nucleus nucleus Coulombic repulsion. And then there is this other term, which is like the term of interest over here, which is nothing but the interaction between the electron and the external potential. And what is the external potential here? The potential created by the nucleus. So this is the term that I want you to remember for the timing and we will go ahead and see this entire Hamiltonian in a little bit more details. So I am, uh, so this was my last slide. So I am just coming to the many body uh, Hamiltonian and I'm writing it up in more details. So this is nothing but the kinetic energy of the nucleus. This is the kinetic energy of the electrons. This is the nucleus nucleus term. You can see this is a Coulombic term. It is nothing but you know Q1, Q2 by R. So this is the Coulombic potential. Whereas this is the Coulombic potential due to the electrons. So now see, this is, uh, has been made in a, a way like the H cut and the Q all are equals to one. So therefore you do not see them in this approximation over here. And then this is the potential term, which is shown in here, the potential energy of the electron that the electron feels due to the nucleus, which we also call the external potential. So if you are until here with me, so then it's uh, basically a little bit steps ahead that I will show you because I am not going to show you many equations in this uh, you know, context here. So this will be all that you would be seeing throughout the, you know, uh, uh, throughout the talk. So not much more than this uh, basically. So, okay, so going forward. So one more step here. So this is an animation that everybody should understand no matter, you know, person who is uh, just pursuing BSc or masters. So everybody understands this approximation, which is the born Oppenheimer approximation. And this is my favorite picture for that. So this is my nucleus. The elephant is going to be my nucleus for the time being. And it has a gash and this gash has some flies. So now suppose this elephant is moving. So no matter how fast the elephant moves, does the fly go away? No, because they, they see like elephant is stationary, right? Because the flies never see like the, in the coordinate frame that the flies are, you know, moving, 
the elef uh, the elephant is always stationary so same thing happens for your nucleus and the electron uh, which is system which you see in here the nucleus is always stationary no matter uh, for the electrons because they are moving at very fast you know time frame compared to the nucleus so therefore uh, this is not an approximation this can be inherited directly and you can think like your hamiltonian which was you know comprising of the uh, uh, many body terms this can be you know shortened out so for example this the black ones that you see in here is nothing but the nuclear uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the nucleus and the potential energy between the nucleus so if there is another nucleus you can think that as the you know potential energy this two can drop down so this will be coming to you know as you will see later so this will be going to zero this will be can, this can be taken as a constant can be added up later and then you will be left with the other three terms which is the electronic terms here so we'll just see in a little bit details what these electronic terms are so let's go ahead so as i told you the kinetic energy is going down to zero kinetic energy of the nucleus and this you know vnn which is the nucleus nucleus you know repulsion so this is going to be what this is going to be taken as a constant so uh, therefore what you are left with is basically you know the kinetic energy of the electrons the potential energy between the electrons which is shown in here this is nothing but your uh, you know coulombic kind of uh, so coulombic kind of you know re repulsion between electrons and then you are having this you know external potential which is the electron faces due to a nucleus where it is you know residing so if it is just swarming around a nucleus so then it will see its external potential which is like the nucleus which is shown in this coordinate capital coordinate rj so which is fine so now you can just you know write them all into a summation you see here this you know this indices the rj is you know constant because it is only one nucleus that you are looking at however it can be several you know electrons around it so therefore this coordinates going to be the about the electron that you are looking at which is this rj the small rj so now we can look into the three equations over here see this is a single electron term because this depends on only one electronic coordinates because whenever you are looking at one electron then basically that electron is in motion and you are talking about that electron so this is the kinetic energy of one electron this is the potential energy that this this the particular electron is feeling so this is again one electron however this is the electron electron term and this is kind of you know a little stunner so we'll just see what uh, to go ahead so therefore now what we are going to uh, do is like this hamiltonian is now shortened and is comprising of the single electron term as i told you that you know uh, it depends on the single electronic index here single electronic index here so these are the single electron term and this is the two body term the two body coulombic repulsion term that you have here so you cannot do much about it if you have practiced a hydrogen atom problem or helium atom problem you will know that this is the you know uh, the main you know prob uh, main problematic term that is going to bug you forever so we have to do something about it to keep uh, so for the time being we will keep it in mind so let's go ahead let's proceed further so i am taking a example of an oxygen atom to start with so it has only eight electrons to look at so it should not bug you you can think like okay only eight electrons but i will tell you what this eight electrons can do to you so see if i write the wave function psi you will say like okay it depends upon eight electrons so i can write the coordinates for eight electrons from r1 to r8 so but then this eight electrons over here are going to depend on three cartesian coordinates the x y z coordinate cartesian coordinates on each so therefore corresponding to this each of these electrons there would be x1 y1 z1 and then x x8 y8 z8 so these are going to be 24 coordinates and then if you have 10 entries per coordinate then you will have to this wave function can be stored in 10 to the power 24 entries so see since this type of you know is like this has been given you know in terms of how many uh, dvds that you need so even today it's going to be very hard to store a wave function as it is right now so it's impossible to tackle this wave function if it cannot be stored you cannot solve anything because a psi is equal to e psi you need the psi to be stored first right so therefore this is a problem so how do we overcome that so the first approximation came in 1928 so is long long years you know back so this approximation is the hartree approximation that we all know 
So this gave birth to the web function based methods. All the web functions based methods, you know, starts after that. So what did Hartree say? So Hartree said like, okay, so uh, like this is 10 to the power 24. But if you write the web function, you know, just like, you know, a product web function, a product web function. So th this is Hartree product. So Hartree product web function, then you can write the coordinates. So, so you can separate the electronic coordinates and you can write them as psi one, psi two, psi three, up, uh, up to psi n. So here it will be like uh, up to, you know, 24, uh, this thing. So all corresponding to each of the Cartesian coordinates, you can think also. So, but these are what? These are spin orbitals. So I will tell you what is spin orbitals a little bit in details later, but you can think that each of the spin orbitals belong to each of the electron. Fine. And then therefore now you can think like, okay, so for each of the Cartesian coordinate, you are going to need only, you know, uh, so each of the Cartesian coordinates, say if it is X1, I will need only 10 coordinates for that. For Y1, I will need again 10 and so on. So therefore I can, you know, for each of this product wave function, I can store them in thousand, you know, uh, coordinates. And therefore, you know, uh, totally I need not much space. We need, we have already reduced our space to 24,000. But 24,000 is still a lot because you are not talking about one electron. You are talking about many electrons and then, you know, many atoms. So then, you know, things becomes more and more cumbersome. So how to handle that? So see, uh, uh, we, so this, this 24,000 for the timing is still, you know, a number. And we can, you know, at least try our, you know, oxygen um, uh, atom, you know, some more, you know, iron atoms using already this. So this was what, you know, Hartree gave and we started with the product web function as it is given over here now. So how to proceed? So proceeding, if you are not aware of this technique over here, which is shown in here, this is called the parisional principle. So this is the, you know, first thing that is done in any computational code. You do what is called parisional principle. You take the help of that to uh, reduce your problem. So what is this problem to be a little bit, you know, a little bit in more details. So this energy is nothing but the energy average of the system. And how do you find the energy average? So you basically have to do this type of, you know, this is given in continuous notation. This can be also written in Dirac's discrete notation. This is nothing but, you know, the, uh, so this, this is nothing but the normalization of the wave function that you do. And this is the Hamil expectation value of the Hamiltonian that you are calculating. And what it basically says is the energy average energy of your system should be greater than equal to a minimum energy, which is this E0, which is your ground state energy. If such is the case, if this is my E0, say the ground state energy, and if you are, your system, no matter wherever you make the average is always you know, higher than this energy, then therefore it gives you a tool is like you can minimize this energy with respect to any component of the psi. Fine. So this gives me a tool already. So and now if this size are what this uh, phi i's that I have written are nothing but your spin orbitals, which is shown in over here. So you kind of minimize it, and you if you minimize it, so you will uh, come out with some uh, some some individual you know one particle Schrodinger equation which is depending upon one particle orbitals, single particle orbitals, which are like this. And if you come up with this term over here, then you can solve them individually. You will just have to solve 24 of them. So this is much easier compared to any other approximation that was done previously. So now what is this term over here? So this is your kinetic energy of the electrons. This is the you know, potential energy that your electrons feels from the nucleus. And then and now we are just talking about like say uh, one electron. So at, at a time we are talking about one nucleus. But then you have, if there are more than one nucleus, you just have to additively add them up. So, okay, fine. And then this is your Hartree term, which is over here. So what is this Hartree term? This is nothing but your Coulombic electron electron re uh, repulsion term. So if you see, and it basically, you know, so, so I will also point you out towards this, which is J not equal to one, because this is what is in only in the Hartree, Hartree approximation you see. So see the electrons, you know, so see, say suppose I have an electron over here and so many other electrons. So electron doesn't feel itself. So it will not look at itself, but it will look at the other electrons which are swarming around. So this is fine. So this is basically the electron electron repulsion. It doesn't, you know, in, uh, it looks at electrons interaction with the surrounding, but itself, which is fine. So now we are going ahead a bit. 
so we are going to look to then how to solve it so this is called the self consistent field cycle so now that you have seen already that this hartree operator is iterative so what does it mean like you know if you can somehow construct you know your preliminary you know wave function somehow so you see all the you know so if you can construct the psi j's somehow then your psi i basically depends on them so it's just like a practical problem like if i think like we are all sitting in a branch if i move my hand so electrons work this way if the uh, so if i move my hand it is as if all my friends around me surrounding me will feel like i am changing so this is how electrons also perceives themselves so if it's, it is like if one electron is changing all the surrounding towards the you know electron will change so this electron suppose this is the ith electron this actually depends on all the other j electrons and vice versa so therefore it gives you a tool to you know iteratively you know modify you know your electron cloud and everything else so how we will just see so i have just written it out in you know also you know words so that you can uh, really understand without you know going towards this picture but this picture is the same thing so what we are going to do is we are going to initially consider some orbitals so we are just going to guess some orbitals and we are going to construct this whole term so the hartree term and the rest is fine so we are just going to you know construct this term over here and then what we are going to do so uh, so once you have this term individually you have written it out for each of them for single particles all the single particles so suppose 24 part so 24 cartesian coordinates you have written them out so you are going to solve them individually and once you solve them you are going to get the psi i's and you are going to get the e i's so with the psi i's you will just check whether it is equal to your initial psi i or not so hopefully like if you are lucky it will be equal but if most of the time you will see it's not lucky so you will just then again you know update whatever psi i you got you will complete this iteration until you are converged by convergence what is meant is like what is your initial guess should be you know equal to your last guess, last output so if that is the thing then you will stop it so this is how you can fill this whole entire problem and if you can understand one it uh, once a cf cycle which is like this no matter wherever you go the scf cycles are all like this so if even if you know you go towards hartree fock or density functional theory this is basically just it so we'll just proceed uh, on to the next so what i want to tell you over here is that see this is nothing but a mean field approximation hartree hartree fock are all mean field approximation what i mean by a mean field approximation is like all the electrons is an ex effective external potential it also interacts with an effective you know electro average you know electrostatic you know repulsion of the other electrons so this is a mean field approximation so uh, then okay you can say okay still it should be fine why should it fail or what is the problem with this you know hartree i could have done hartree forever so you can't because there are few fundamental problems so if you see like here if i am going to you know say suppose i am going to put uh, the same so uh, two electrons so two orbitals that you see in the same coordinate so i am going to make it r1 so what happens here if i put two r1s it remains right but if you know like if you know the physics the statistics you know two electrons with the same you know orbitals cannot reside at the same place so therefore this basically gives you what a wrong you know uh, so it's uh, kind of contradictory you to your pauli principle also the other thing that you should note over here if i interchange this indices i and j then also this wave functions remains the same basically so therefore this is also violating my pauli principle so this two are the violations here which cannot you know be proceeded so therefore what is to be done so in you know late you know 1930s hawk and you know slater independently gave an approximation which is this slater determinant so this determinant if you see if you go back to your books and brush up you will see this you know solves all the problem that i have just discussed with the hartree you know product wave function in sense that you see like okay this uh, if i write it as a determinantal form but you will see like this basically if i change interchange the you know indices so positions of the electrons now you will see that like, you know this is going to be minus of this so pauli exclusion is satisfied the other thing that is also satisfied is like if i just make this you know uh, this this indices also alpha so this is has been written in you know, the spin orbital form so explicitly where you see the spin orbitals 
So now I say like, okay, I will make this also alpha over here. And then this uh, electrons are also going to reside in here. So if I do that, you see this column and this column are going to be same. And if this happens, your entire, you know, wave function becomes zero. So which means like, you know, Pauli exclusion is satisfied over here. So these are the two things that is, you know, gained over, you know, uh, the uh, other product wave function uh, over here. So this wave function is the determinantal wave function. This is the wave function that we use today. So this is given by Fock, and this is the one that we, would sh we should proceed on. So we will proceed on, and if we proceed, what we will see is nothing but this. Again, this is your uh, one electron term. So the kinetic energy and the potential energy term that you have seen before. This is the Hartree-like term, but it is not the exactly the Hartree term. Why not? I will just tell you in a moment. And then there is one more term which is coming. This is the term that is coming due to this product wave function. So because if you see, if I you know open it up even for the two, two, uh, two electrons, which is over here, say, so you will get this term, which is psi i r1, psi j r2, and then minus psi, one, uh, psi i r2, my, uh, psi j r1. So this is the cross term that is you know, coming over here. And in this cross term, you see initially here, it was psi j times psi j, whereas this is psi j times psi i over here. So you really cannot do much about it. It is not a row that you will write it. So this term you know, comes and you are calling it as an exchange term because this is coming from the cross, cross term, right? So this, is, this remains there. But however, uh, so now I will uh, uh, tell you what is the difference between the Hartree term and uh, so Hartree term in this Hartree Fock equation and Hartree term in Hartree. So you see what is the difference is nothing but initially, if you remember, we had, you know, J not equals to I in here, right? Uh, J not equals to I, we had it in here. But however, here we do not have that. We have J equals to one to all. So basically when one electron sees it, it will also include itself. So interaction with itself, which is unphysical, but it is still there. So therefore it includes the self interactions, a particle self interaction with itself is included in this term. However, Hartree equation, Hartree Fox equations are the best equation because it also corrects it. See this J equals to I is included in this term, but it's corrected and taken care of in the second term where you know if you go from one to uh, so i uh, j equals to uh, one to n and when it becomes j equals to i this will basically cancel this term over here so self interaction is there in the hartree term but it's cancelled you know from the exchange term so therefore hartree folks are the you know exact uh, equations that you can uh, obtain and the solution you can obtain for atoms and molecules but still we do not practice hartree fock much of now as of today. Why not? Because you know, the storing the data still remains a huge problem and it's also very time consuming. So we do not really you know, practice wave function based approach. So here we are brought to density functional theory. So I'll just you know, again try to you know, uh, quickly go through density functional theory without you know, showing you much of equations and the jargons. Let us see like how we can go towards it. So let us look into these problems over here. So suppose this is my external potential shown. So this is an external potential shown. It is an external potential shown. And I'm trying to solve it. So I can try to find the psi and I can do the psi star psi. And you will see like always the density which is given by the psi star psi is always different compared to, uh, so uh, uh, like for different, you know, P of R, you will have different rho of R. Like the way you will have different psi of R's. So this is the you know, starting point of density functional theory. And the theory starts when? This theory starts when Huenberg and Kohn gave their theorem, so first theorem in 1960s, where they said like, okay, see, traditionally what you have been practicing is that like you should have a potential, then you will, uh, then, then you will solve the Hamiltonian, you will find the psi, and then you will construct the psi star psi, which is the rho density. But he said, see, density is also uniquely dependent on PR. So it should be vice versa that V of R will be also, so also can be represented by the density. So when he said this, this, you know, changed the complete, you know, uh, uh, complete, you know, way of looking at things. So what it is, uh, what he said basically is he gave you a tool to have a, having a macroscopic identity for your you know, V of R, which is this potential. So this uh, solves a lot of problem. We will just see how. 
so a uh, moment later so uh, uh, like a few years later consham gave this you know theorem which is like every observable quantity of a quantum mechanical system can be calculated from density of the system alone so this is the birth of density functional theory from here so initially from uh, like fr uh, until now everybody thought like okay is the wave function which has to be known to get any observable but right now for the first time you know consham said like okay if you know the density you can also find any observable and observables are what your properties that you are looking for what we are trying to solve right so this is fine so and then like you know uh, so i am not going towards the you know details of the other things that is you know coming with it so okay fine so now you know th this is this is means any observable can be you know written from you know uh, so this was only a function of psi before but now psi is explicitly a function of rho so you can think about this observable to be a function of rho which is fine so this is the consham theorem 1 so now we go to the consham theorem 2 which says that it's also you know the variational principle that we have used before so in the variational principle if you remember we are just minimizing with you know psi but now we can also minimize with respect to rho because rho is also so it depends explicitly on rho so your uh, size are functionals of rho so your energy is a functional of rho so uh, psi are function of rho and energy is a function of psi therefore energy is a functional of rho so this is what you know this uh, theorem says the second theorem that you can use the variational principle which is fine so this gave birth to the you know density functional theory and if you see the energy expression in density functional theory you will realize that there is a kinetic energy term there is a external potential term as before and then there is a hartree term which is the classical coulomb term which is the electron electron repulsion term but it includes the self interaction over here it has the self interaction because this is also not the product wave function this is the other determinantal wave function that we are considering therefore we have a classical coulomb term also so the self interaction also which is included and then there is this exchange correlation term so which is the you know uh, which is a thing that we should look for so what is this exchange and correlation so you see whatever we can find a expression valid expression with respect to de density we have put it over here we can write the classical coulomb term the counterpart with the density which is here so we can also write the external potential as a function of density which is here which is over here we can also write the kinetic energy of non interacting particles which is a fictitious kind of system which i have written over here but what we can't write is the kinetic energy of a non so interacting particle right so if these particles are interacting instead of non interacting we can't write the explicit energy so density dependence so i can't write it like that so therefore whatever we do not know which is the you know difference of the kinetic energy for a you know a system which is interacting this difference will go into the exchange correlation the correction for the self energy which is here it will go into the exchange correlation then the particle exchange that will go into the exchange correlation and particle correlation with each other will also go into the exchange corre uh, correlation term this is all this you know all the you know major cats so all of them are hidden in your uh, you know all the problematic uh, things are already hidden in your exchange correlation however rest of the things are you know all known and you put them so but then you can say then what is there so you are just you know you do not know the explicit form of this but you are saying something yeah this is because this still works very fine because you see we are uh, going to write it in terms of this so when we you know do the you know so from here what we will do is we will take the help of variational principle and we will write you know the equation similar to hartree or hartree fock equations if you remember these are all going to be one particle equations and if you write it as one particle equation then your problem is solved because you see right now whatever you have within is supposedly if i give you a vxc is known and you have single particle equations which you can solve for their energies and size right so this is going to be great so this is a very good starting point to look at although you do not explicitly know the vxc so what we can do at the end is like we can you know uh, take some form of vxc so suppose i take any form of vxc this is the lda where it explicitly depends on the density it's uh, the ggf where it explicitly depends on a gradient of density and the density 
and there are other functionals as well so you can you know go to improved exchange correlation functional so if you suppose you know do uh, uh, you know have a very good exchange correlation functional then what will happen over here is this basically you can write the loop which i have told you before also this is the self consistency loop that i have written over here so suppose now i have given you a functional and you can you know uh, you know this term over here you know this term over here and you are just you know adding them up so you can you know effectively write the external potential so effective potential so if you write it as effective potential and you are setting up your uh, schrodinger equation as shown in this you can find the psi is as before so and then when you know the psi is you can find actually the density from this psi is and you can see like whatever was your starting density is equal to this density or not if it is equal then fine but if it is not equal then you can still iterate it further and further and precisely you know uh, make your web functions from this density and you will get the web functions as well in the as a by product and then you will also get the new densities so you can keep on doing that and this is going to be very fast also its its storage is much more improved because now the density that you see depends explicitly on just x y and z which is three cartesian coordinates so this is how in the modern day density functional theory saves you from so much of you know storage problem and you solve so many problems physicists uh, like us you know practice is uh, day in and day out so okay so i have you know told you most of it uh, right now so now i will show you some of the approximations so what is the approximation so you can you know have a relativistic core or non relativistic core i'm not going towards the details of that so except for this we would be looking at some of the celebrated approximations so exchange correlations are gga lda or some other exchange correlations like pb sol and so many others so it it's there that i have already discussed with you not going into so much in details but for this you know community for this talk so this is going to be the one that we should look at which is the basis functions so i am just going over and telling you briefly what are basic basic uh, basis functions of course these are more involved than whatever i am telling you so i am just giving you some hints so that you can look up later so see this brings us to our the difference between the localized system and extended system as i have told you before so here the basis functions are nothing but the size that i have shown you so see suppose i draw a psi over here and a psi over here so these are going to drop down and i want them to drop down because i do not want the functions to be extended over in space because your molecule is confined over here right within this domain so therefore you are basically your gaussian type wave functions are shown in here which is nothing but this so is is a function like this so you have to pick up a basis function like this for a localized system whereas for a, a periodic system if you see the unit cell will be repeated in space and it will keep on going in every direction it will just add up so therefore you are going to talk about a extended system in here and when you are talking about a extended system you are going to employ a plane wave basis set and therefore plane wave basis set is what we should be looking at for a extended you know bulk like system okay fine so i will now come back to you know basis set so what we you know use for you know writing out our basis set is nothing but this you know lcao which is nothing but linear combination of atomic orbitals so you see these are all atomic orbitals over here and you are writing them as a linear combinations of the atomic orbitals c1 chi1 c2 chi2 like that so as many as so you can read out in details later so you know you should have to you know have more and more you know atomic orbitals but for getting you know better and better results so these are already centered on these are actually centered on atoms so therefore they are also called atom centered orbitals so also you know uh, so you should choose a lot of you know uh, wave functions for better and accurate results okay fine so now you know what are chemist choice so chemist or biologist who are looking at you know molecules their choice is generally the atom centered orbitals which are like also uh, gaussian type or slater type but with slater type there was a problem it was e to the power minus alpha r so this you know is still makes your two two body pro two electron problem integration hard however here if you take a even you know function which is like e to the power alpha r square which is nothing but the gaussian type orbital then it becomes uh, much easier uh, because your uh, you, it makes your life much easier because you can do the two integral uh, two inti uh, two electron integrals you can solve them much simply 
So this is what you know you call STO and GTOs. And your Gaussian, if you are using a package called Gaussian, so this is nothing but you know based on your GTOs, right? So fine. So and here I have told you already as many as you know basis set that you take is better. But then what we physicists look at is something called uh, already I told you is plane wave basis set. which is nothing but because you know this is a plane wave and this is you know what you the, the reciprocal lattice that has been shown in here so i'm not going so if you are not familiar with plane wave basis set or plane waves i'm not going into the details of that so only thing is that you will need a lot of plane waves because as many as plane waves is better for you know representing your areas which are near your core because in order to represent a, a, you know a area or function near your core you will need a lot of wave functions over here so basically this will be required so and then we just choose a cut off so we give a cut off and uh, as many as you know waves can be encompassed within that that is you know basically your cut off and you use that you give a cut off and you use the number of plane waves that comes within the cut off to design your basis set so then what are the you know pros and cons of having plane wave basis set plane waves are all orthogonal to each other which is very nice so then uh, you can so they can help you in fast fourier transformation which is also very nice then they the uh, so implicit periodicity is there you do not have to do anything for the periodicity they use you know everybody is same so all, all your cores and all your you know valence cell would be you know treated similar to each other but then there is this problem also because you will need many plane waves and therefore you have to you know uh, judicially choose them so how do you choose it is generally the, you know also called pseudo potentials that you might have heard if you are using a plane wave code so what are pseudo potentials so that brings me to here so this part of the thing so you can either have a full potential or pseudo potential so pseudo potentials are nothing but like if you are going to change so if you look at looking at the code the potential varies very rapidly right so then your wave function will also vary very rapidly here it's not shown like that in practice it will vary like something like this so in order to change this type of you know thing what we do is we replace it with a pseudo potential which is like you know a potential which is looking like this corresponding to which the wave function will be much uh, smoother which is shown in red so this is basically all about pseudo potential so i will summarize my talk over here so what i have given you a lecture is about you know localized basis sets which are used for atoms and molecules so which are used in codes like gaussian so uh, there are many other codes so you can you know just go and visit this particular website in here although like there is also like we have also talked about the bulk materials also not in much details but we are going to use the plane wave basis set for them so also we can have a mix of basis set like you know as atom centered basis set which are also plane wave type in nature so those we can you know also do so uh, and uh, where we are going to use them generally in like heterostructure like surface and other extended systems we are looking at then we would you know go towards those type of basis set so okay so this is my summary but uh, you know i do not want to finish it up just now just bear with me for two three more minutes i will just you know show you what are the things that we are doing in our lab so for the time being so uh, we model a lot of semiconductors which are bulk like materials i do not have you know a full fledged slide for you right now but we model you know defect states in semiconductors so we do them some accurate calculations using density functional theory so not going into the details of that we do a lot of charge transport calculations so we calculate the cbeg the sigma which are the charge transport coefficient for bulk like materials also with defects and other things so we look into those we look into some heat transport calculations as well that has been shown in here so we calculate the lattice thermal conductivity we see the effect of defect states into the lattice thermal conductivity we see things like that and uh, we also look into the physics of correlated materials by correlated materials like we mean like where there are spins and the spins are correlated to you know another lattice the you know different atoms of that and they change very rapidly with respect to each other so we also look into those materials so these are what we do from the first principles perspective but we also do some experiment we have started doing some experiment very recently so yes we do also some predictions using uh, machine learning models we use machine learning to predict some models so this is fine so uh, this is uh, finally my group so one person is missing over here that is the newest addition is not not here 
so this is practically my group in iit bombay so we have already set up a small computer cluster of our own and we are also uh, now you know procuring a ulvac uh, so zem3 unit for you know uh, measuring the you know transport coefficient so finally like i want to so here i haven't included all my you know collaborators in fact i have very nice collaborators from you know various you know iits in uh, india also from outside so i haven't given you a full fledged slide about my collaborators over here and uh, yeah so i you know uh, acknowledge iit bombay seed grant which is huge it has given to me so iit bombay and then i also acknowledge dst and acrb for giving me the grants for my work and uh, then i also acknowledge gis for you know uh, arranging this uh, nice platform so thank you gis for inviting me and having me over here okay so with this i uh, thank you for uh, thank you all for your attention yes wow what a talk thank you very much amrita for such a excellent talk you spoke in a very uh, nice way uh, in such a way so that a person from different field uh, now has an idea of basic quantum mechanics and then dft which is also very important for even a computational biophysicist who works on structures of biomolecules like me very oh. impressive thank you very much yeah, yeah. You. you 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 reminds me the days uh, the uh, when we work on this part uh, this things or we started this things so thank you very much so on behalf of our institute I thank you very much firstly for accepting our invitation to talk and secondly for such a nice talk we expect uh, in the coming days again if we uh, request you you Uh, will again speak for us yes yeah, surely uh, surely we'll do that so it's not a problem yeah thank you uh, so let us go start the question answer session there are many many uh, thank you ma'am wonderful talks what a nice presentation this is flooded with that nice and very informative session thank you ma'am could you please provide recording video it's very helpful nice talk useful session is there any um, uh, let me see is there any feedback form a lot of things so let's come to the questions uh, the first one uh, from uh, anonymous attendee uh, can we apply dft over the system where we do not know the exact structure of the molecule yeah yeah so that is that is what the beauty of dft is you do not have to know the exact structure but if you know the composition that will do so for example even if i do not tell you like what a hydrogen molecule exactly sorry sorry not maybe like water molecule maybe looks like i can you know rotate the angles i can you know make it turn and make it a linear molecule i can give it to your dft system then it can iterate and give you the structure because it will iterate and it will give you the exact charge density and from that you can see that it will look like completely like your water molecule that's the beauty great uh, okay the next one hi uh, thank you for a nice intro for dft so this is from carmel esther uh, uh, carmel esther again uh, ask you another question i have a question do we have any possibility to give input from eels or optical spectra yes yes so uh, all the you know excited state properties can be also done using dft but that is under the you know a thing that is called density functional perturbation theory so you can also like do all the excited state calculations using perturbation theory and you can look at all those you know absorption spectrum excited state prex spectrum if you are looking at so but this is just about density functional theory that i have given you a over overview but in, in uh, nonetheless if you're looking at the temperature you know involved properties or magnetic field or electric field you can use a perturbative approach and you can study all of them okay uh, next is from dr jyoti kapali uh, please explain a little on correlation between electrons and also pseudo potentials so uh, explain in details is it Yeah. So uh, yeah, yes, actually, yes, explain the, a little, a little yeah. on yes, yes. A little, <laughs> yeah, maybe a little is fine because uh, I I usually give two lectures on pseudo potentials, 
also i give some lectures on you know exchanges so maybe a little is fine but you know more involved than little is going to be very hard right now in this time frame so if you see like you know exchange correlations so exchange correlations what are are what we do not know right but we just hope like you know it's going to you know iteratively solve itself and therefore no matter whatever we take as the starting point it will iteratively you know converge and we will get some something good and meaningful out of it so basically the first exchange the lda that is the you know base you know starting point of any exchange that you see in the earth is nothing but a density approximation where you just start like you know you find the density corresponding to psi star psi and then you just like whatever orbital you take you take the density from that and you just uh, generate a function which is some coefficient of you know n times you know the density times dr the integration of that over space so it's basically nothing but so suppose i have a atom and i have density corresponding to that like like here so i have taken so you can think about atom and the you know atomic orbitals that you are taking so you can generate a density corresponding to that and then you can just you know uh, integrate it as a function of spatial coordinate so any uh, generalized gradient approximation meta gga or any other approximations are some kind of you know approximation uh, over on top of lda so they are not much you know steps ahead they are just you know step ahead of lda so this is it and you also talked about pseudo potential right you wanted to know more about pseudo potentials so pseudo potentials i haven't also included much in here so basically you know pseudo potentials can be of many different sort so there there are you know different you know approaches that people follow so it goes on a like it will take a lot of time if i try to tell you what is the difference between the different pseudo potentials for now i will just tell you like if it is near the core then you can just the core electrons has to be treated separately because this wave function over here so as you see the core you know function over here so core potential you know drops very drastically as a result of here which you know the wave function that you see is going to be you know changing very rapidly in order to you know uh, mimic the situation we will need more and more plane waves a lot of plane waves which is not possible for us to you know really arrange so what we do is like we just change the you know potential instead of having a you know potential exactly like this we uh, kind of treat everything the valence cell so this is the valence we treat treat the valence cell similar to what it is it should be however from a exact point so where we know like where we have to have a cut off which is coming towards the core we just change it we make it like this so that you know the wave function is much smooth which is like this it anyhow doesn't affect because if you know if you are studying a periodic system you know that you know the valence electrons are the ones which basically you know the ones that are filled towards the top are only you know interacting with the system outside okay so uh she also has another question please explain a little about dft plus u so here i have so those are all dft intricate dft methods so if you want to know those so i am going to you know uh, how do i do it over here so dft plus u is like for if, if your electrons are very very localized say suppose d orbitals so a lot of localized this thing so then you know normal you know plane wave approximations doesn't hold because plane waves are already delocalized right so if you have to localize them then you really have to have something else so which is this u so once you have this u parameter which is the hubbard u if you incorporate the hubbard u then you can make it more localized so that goes to you know completely a tight binding kind of approach so it's like also can be done with dft but you have to really read the physics about it so probably trying to incorporate a session in this semester in my you know series so trying to do that so u is not discussed in here for the time being okay uh so the next is um, seema prashad from sambalpur university odisha she asked why dft is more reliable than hf method so actually uh, dft uh, probably is not more reliable so D dft is not reliable but dft so hf methods if you can apply to any material is more reliable no doubt 
so there is no doubt that h8 will give you exactly the energies and all that single particle energies and everything so but you know the problem is like hf you cannot apply to anything beyond you know water molecule so if you really want to use hartree fock to any other system which is more relevant and realistic maybe your dna maybe your rna if you are a biologist but if i am a physicist if i am talking about a defective system a extended system then i can't apply hf hartree fock so that is the problem it's not the reliability the question is the storing of the wave functions hartree fock doesn't you know really give you the you know tool to you know store the wave functions the product wave functions that you see so the um, not the determinant uh, determinantal wave function so in order to store it you will have to store it in forms of density and therefore you know you can uh, do it for you know many systems so no matter whatever systems you look at and therefore you are going to use dft for your day to day applications okay so the next one is from kush koshik do the dft text solvent interaction into consideration uh, what what is this interaction so uh, solvent. solvent solvent interaction so actually yes so you can you know uh, so for example if you have a molecule so you can you know put some dielectric constant so so i think your solvent is some kind of liquid that you are thinking so you just have to put a dielectric medium around so if you put the dielectric constant of that solvent then you can also model your dft calculations to you know uh, the solvent interaction take into account of that okay so uh, next is from prakash govindaraj very nice presentation ma'am using 403 pi code to calculate lattice thermal conductivity for the any material 2x 2x 2 supercell 2 into 2 into 2 supercell not x by mistake in vats separating many displaced pocars i don't know what is that right <laughs> here we go to calculate forces for all pocar poscars in my system i uh, have 10640 poscars <laughs> it takes long time to calculate i guess this is some code that uh, he, he is talking yeah, yeah. about so, uh, yeah yeah, so, yeah. python so, codes i guess yes yeah, mm -hmm. can you can you tell me the last line so maybe like uh, i yeah, can yeah yeah just... yeah it says it takes long time to calculate forces for that so ma'am give me any suggestion for reduce computational time yes so uh, yeah so uh, you can use density functional perturbation theory so you use dft so phonopi so don't use the finite displacement so if you use finite displacement then you would be lost in you know doing the replicas but if you so also like you are using the enharmonic ones right so yeah so it can't can't help so if depending upon the symmetry maybe you can you know try to you know reduce the symmetric constraints so if you are using a symmetry of like 10 to the power minus 3 or something try to use a little lower symmetry uh, constant make it 10 to the power minus 2 or 10 to the power uh, like 10 to the power minus 2 is fine or 10 to the power minus 1 so if you use su such kind of symmetric constant probably some of your symmetric poskers will reduce so if it reduces probably it will help you to calculate but if you are again you know if you are doing a pono 3 pi calculation and harmonic calculation you cannot really help but you have to you know do so many calculations so i'm sorry yeah this is how it is <laughs> okay so it from shrishnath upadhyay uh, i need to know a little bit about basis set so basis set yeah so it's like everybody needs to know a lot about basis sets uh, really so it's like uh, yes so uh, basis sets are basically this so whenever you write it like this so it's like Uh, whenever i write a psi a wave function how do i write it i so if i want to write a ket psi say i write it as c1 psi1 c2 psi2 and so on so in a hilbert space it can be many as many as you know uh, the small wave functions that you are taking in each of the direction that matters right and you have to have a complete basis set right so the thing is by completeness what i mean is nothing but ideally what you should have is like the c1 square which is psi star psi so uh, like c1 into say c1 star plus c2 into c2 star 
so all this should be equal to one then you say like okay my basis set is complete ideally you should have a complete basis set but you know like when you are looking at you know atom centered basis set or at a, so the basis set like you know the, uh, this this basis set gtos stos you cannot check whether you have completeness or not so what therefore what you do is you generally incorporate as many as basis sets as possible when you are looking at a you know confined system like linear system like this because uh, these basis sets are not completely orthogonal and orthonormal and then they are also uh, like you cannot really check the completeness of this so basically when you are looking at a you know really confined system then it becomes a little bit you know hard to you know guess your basis set like how many molecular orbitals you should take and how many should be adequate this is the problem however when you are looking at any plane web code so then how do you check whether your basis set is enough or your uh, like number of waves that you have taken is going to give you a correct answer or not what you generally do in this case is something practical more practical there is this tag which is called n cut generally it's called n cut in bhas e cut in you know uh, quantum espresso and like that so on so you just you know adjust this so that means like you are going to in incorporate more plane waves and if you incorporate more plane waves you can see like whether your total energy is improving or not if it is not improving any much that it means like your in cuts or a number of plane waves that you have employed is sufficient to give you a convergence so this is how you check whether your basis sets are complete or not okay so the next one is from uh, karmel from germany um the question is are you also working on oxidized semiconductors and composites uh not so much actually no I do not have so much of you know uh, you know understanding of uh, so, like uh, uh, some oxides yes but like you know mostly you know oxides are very much complicated you have to be lost in the u parameters and taking them like with transition mix metal oxides and all that so not so much the next one is from pankaj kumar singh he asked can we find the valence band and conduction band position of semiconductor material via dft also tell about the bond length and band gap so bond lengths are fine you know we can you know do a lot of optimizations and you can see that structures are always given very much fine by dft but band gap is a problem because you see dft is a ground state you know uh, theory so no matter whatever you get so you get all already all the you know uh, uh, psi i's that i have shown you so all the single particle energies that you get but you know those energies are not you know completely the energy of the your excited system as you know like you know the valence bands are the excited states and then the, there is this sorry sorry the conduction bands are excited states and the excited state properties are what you should be looking at so uh, in principle so what you can do is like you can get you know better and better you know uh, scores like in fact exchange and correlations also you can uh, you know use for example hybrid you know functionals or even if you go to gw then even better so green's wave function so on top of dft then you can you know improve your band gap and everything so dft band gaps are usually underestimated but if you go to higher level theories then you can you know uh, calculate those and you can get exactly the you know excited state properties okay uh, from sima prasad prashad again ma'am can you please provide your email id so that i can contact you again as i am pursuing phd during dft using dft calculations uh, for yes. sima prashad so, yes her email id is always already provided <laughs> yeah so is there right so you can just write yeah yes okay uh, from shubham sharma can we use gaussian for periodic structure like graphene and his next question can be find the band gap of semiconductor using gaussian so yeah, uh, probably you can do that but uh, you can do that but how effective that would be so that i am not sure so why do you want to use gaussian for you know uh, graphene so for graphene you can uh, easily pick graphene. you know quantum espresso or something right so it's a extender system you can just use quantum espresso or any other pre code 
so plane wave codes are already there so you really do not need to use you know uh, like gaussian for you know graphene unless you really need to yeah okay uh next is your chat window is also flooded with questions so it says um onurag ja uh, he says mm, thank you ma'am it was very nice session and lot of my doubts got cleared clarified sorry two questions number one how does temperature affect the energy landscape what how does temperature affect does? the ener temperature how okay. does yeah, temperature yeah, 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 yeah. affect yeah. the energy landscape <laughs> yeah so uh, for that you generally do ab initio thermodynamics so energy uh, temperature does affect a lot you know so uh, you have to uh, take care of the free energies you have to calculate all the free energies so vibrational free energies there are other methods to calculate the free energies like even if you are just uh, you know not using you know already df so you if you even if you are doing dft but you really want to take into account of temperature effects then you can also do molecular dynamics and also th those anharmonic effects can be also taken into account my uh, colleague in uh, iit bomb uh, so iit delhi shashwat bhattacharya he uh, does a lot of you know those calculations so uh, i mean ab initio at atomistic thermodynamics and all that so but generally you can calculate the free energies like you know the way the other person said phono 3 pi or something this gives also the free energies and you can uh, calculate the free energy vibrational free energy as a function of temperature you can add it to your total energy that you get from dft so the static energies you can add them up and you can compare the phases so you can see the phase stabilities are generally affected by those okay so question number 2 from onurag jha is is gaussian an approximation for the wave function no no so yes wave functions are always uh, some approximation right because nobody has exactly seen an wave function but gaussians are uh, ac more or less accurate wave functions for these molecular systems that you see in here so the gaussians are somewhat you know these are all approximations this l this quantum numbers m these are known but then whatever you do this you know r you have to give an approximation for that this alpha is an approximation that you have to give so gaussians are an approximation for wave function that is true but then you are iterating right you are iteratively solving so this wave functions no matter whatever you approximate it before will get better and better and you will get a perfect perfect wave function which gives you to brings you down to the ground state energy which is this e0 over here okay third is apart from plane wave what is the other kind of basis set that for such ab initio calculations so apart from plane waves so uh, plane waves are uh, this so this this waves that i have shown you already so uh, this uh, vanier functions that i have shown you already so you can take this as the basis set so these are reliable for the extended system you can take you know this atomic orbital type you know basis set so which are this e to the power minus alpha r square this you can also take for you know molecules and you know uh, like your rna and your dnas and all that so also then they are also repetitive and in chains so you can probably also go to you know plane waves probably so but then there are you know other uh, basis set also which are called numeric so i will just go to the next slide which is the numeric atoms so uh yeah 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 here so you see so you can have a hybrid within you know this so when you are not so much of looking at you know computational cost you have some computational cost so then you can you know do something in between which are you know numeric atom centered basis set so numeric atom center basis set so which are you know somewhat you know different kind of than the normal plane waves so they somehow you know are atom centered so they are you know extended but they have this type of you know uh, localized peaks in the atom and in the other region also like it will have some extensions like this so you can also go for this type of you know codes so these are fhi ams then elks and the other codes are also there so you can look towards uh, those type of basis sets as well so these are a hybrid basis set between your 
localized purely localized basis set and purely plane wave basis set you can have you know some other basis set also which are more involved and time consuming but gives you better results more accurate results okay so he says thank you ma'am okay. uh, another another question is uh, ma'am from uh, he this is from shonam rai um Sonam asks, uh, "Ma'am, where from where I can learn ab more about GFT, like this type of advanced study?" So uh, nowadays there are so many, you know, uh, courses over also YouTube which are freely available. So some chemistry, quantum chemistry course. So you can go through all of them. So those are very nice, you know. So I have found few. So maybe like I will send some link to uh, Professor Devavani Ganguly. and she will share it to you already already so if you can keep it there you know somewhere so that like you guys can also visit that and learn more so although there are some books but books are more involved so and it generally throws throws people away so who are starting for the first time so it's better to go start with some youtube videos which are more generic and general okay so uh, give um... email me so i will forward you all the information that um, dr bhattacharya will send me okay and yes. uh, the next is the next is uh, he says uh, so sonam rai says uh, he, he is doing a phd in chemistry using dft okay. okay so the next question is from rohit srivastava ma'am how to use dft in plasmonics plasmonics so yeah so the, the, you know this is also an off topic for me plasma you know I, i'm not sure so it's like you would be having a lot of interaction with your uh, surrounding right so here we are just talking about the surrounding really in vacuum and all that but plasma plasmonics i'm not sure like so much right now okay uh, uh from an anonymous attendee how do we get the density initially that is to start with so to start with what you do is generally you just choose your basis set so suppose i uh, what i am going to choose say suppose i have a oxygen molecule and a hydrogen molecule what i find out is like what are the nlms so i will go again to this so i, I will just figure out what are my nl and m so i will know what are the nl so this this quantum numbers for uh, principal quantum numbers and other quantum numbers for my hydrogen molecule and my oxygen molecule say and i will construct this basis uh, so i will construct my orbitals so once i know my orbitals i will just do psi star psi it's that simple so if you just find the you know if you know like your this psi over here just have to find a psi star psi so if you can find a so this is a, a linear combinations of atomic orbitals so you are going to have as many as atomic orbitals as you like so you will change this you will have several combinations of this alphas you will have several combinations of them so you will just add them up you will make a basis set and then you just have to do a psi star psi to get the initial density so once you have the initial density then you will just iterate and make it better and better so first you have to choose your basis set so that's what you do okay uh um i think there are no other questions except thank you thank you and thank you ma'am um there is a request uh, for the recording or the yes yeah, yeah. so recording uh, is fine so if you, if you, they want it you can share it i have no problem with that yeah okay so it is already uh, you will find the facebook live in our facebook page from dis institute of advanced studies and research facebook page and uh, it was uh, it will be tagged with um, dr bhattacharya facebook page so uh, if you can uh, you can have that access from facebook live page or if not then send me an email so that i will send the recording link to you okay but uh, unless you sent me the email it is not possible for us to track you at who uh, request those so uh, yeah pankaj kumar singh he just e uh, wrote his email id but it would be really helpful if you send the email with that request to 
uh, the link that you get or the email um, you get from Zoom. So we have that all uh, the information over there. But if you do not uh, send us that email there, uh, it would be very, very difficult for us to go and find from this chat section. Okay, so please send us the request via the email that Zoom sent you. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, we do not have uh, do not have any other questions, I guess. And uh, yeah, uh, somebody says uh, the provide link of Facebook page. Okay, so here I am. Uh, in the chat section, I am writing the email uh, address and the link of the face Facebook page. Okay, so this is, and I'm also sending my email ID as well as uh, the Omrita, could you please write down your uh, email ID to the yes. chat section so yeah, that they I'll, have I'll, yours? I'll, yes, yes, I'll yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I will just have to get out of this window, I think. So otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. So otherwise, it will be a problem. So I can also speak, right? So uh, oh, yeah, I'll, do, yeah, yeah, I'll do one thing. I'll just write it somewhere here, right? So then it will be better. So it's b dot amrita ten at gmail dot com. So b dot amrita ten at gmail dot com. Okay. So you have uh, the email ID of Dr. Bhattacharya as well. Yes, so you can write to me. I will get to you, uh, get back to you in time. Yeah, surely. This is somebody, uh, uh, Ayush Singhal, who asked that B dot Amrita, B dot um, I'm writing it down here. B dot Amrita Chen, right? Yes, b dot amrita ten at gmail dot com. Ha, I I just wrote it. So or you can do one thing. So better thing is to you know share uh, search with my name Amrita Bhattacharya. You will also get my you know uh, work email and all that. So all detail. Not, yes. I am not that difficult yes. to find. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or you you may go to the IIT Bombay website and uh, you will find her. Yeah. So it's not very difficult to find. So you can just search. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Then uh, thank you. Thank you yes. once again. Thank you very much. Um, so the all for the all attendees, uh, please feel free to contact her or contact us so that we can uh, connect you. And tomorrow we will have another interesting talk. Details are available in our Facebook page. See you then tomorrow evening. Thank you very yeah, much for the please, participation thank you for, uh, and yeah, so, uh, attending the talk. Yeah, thank you, uh, Devavanidi, for calling me over here. So it's very nice, very pleasant here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, it's a nice, much. nice discussion. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you. So thank I'm you. ending yeah. the webinar for all. Yeah. yeah sure, have a nice sure. day. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Surely. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. bye, -bye.